everybody, and welcome to Cat's Cradle, the sideshow to Sword of Symphonies, where instead of telling you guys a story, we take a little break to talk about the gearbox of this whole thing, the game Heroic Chord, and me, Cat. But not the company gearbox, that's a mess. Oh boy, that is a mess. A gearbox is a physical object. It it's is. It's true, it is. That's what I was... Re- the gearbox, the thing that makes a car run. In this case, it is not a car, but it is a tabletop RPG called Heroic Accord. Or maybe Sort of Symphonies is the car. Maybe Sort of Symphonies is the car. It's a possibility. Mm. But today we're going to talk about something uh, special and integral to the game system. And what would that be, Kat? We are going to talk about magic. Yes, we are. We're also going to talk about that uh, Kirsten isn't here this week. Unfortunately, she was not feeling well. I missed the last Cat's Cradle because I was recovering from surgery. It was great. So does that mean I'm going to have to miss the next one for some reason? Like, do we have to keep this sort of going in order? Well, let's hope not. Yeah. I mean, I've always thought of Cat's Cradle as being a show I do with Kathleen, and then Nick and Kirsten might be there. So, (laughs) Good enough. (laughs) It'll be fun. We'll have a fun time. This topic, um, we're going to be talking about the magic system, and this was not my idea. Whose idea was it to talk about it magic? It was my idea because I like casting spells in this game. <laughs> Yay. It is pretty rad. I'm all yours. What do you want to know? I don't know. I think it was uh, kind of like one of the first things I really atta- got attached to when um, you first sent me, like, whatever previous playtest version of her accord that we got that like really intrigued me was the magic system. Like from a world building's perspective, I think it's kind of interesting that, uh, I guess I'm going to reference, um, a game that rhymes with, uh, B and B a lot in this podcast, because I don't have as much RPG experiences, like probably some of our listeners even. Brungeons and Brogons. Exactly. By, like, uh, mages of the shore. So, like, in that other game, you kind of have the idea that, like, uh, magic comes from your connection to some sort of deity. But um, I really like the idea that magic is this thing that, like, you tap into the world around you. Um and sort of, like, manifest, and that doing so there's an exchange that you sort of, like, leave a little bit of yourself in the everything else that I thought was really neat. But I also really like, like, the sort of free-form way that it works. The thing is, it actually wasn't always this way. First of all, I've always loved free-form magic. My favorite kinds of spells, even in Brungeons and Dragons, has always been utility spells. I love spells that solve a problem, even if it's not necessarily a combat problem. My friend loves to tell a story of the time he and his party were fighting a hydra on a hill, and he cast grease, and the big dumb idiot fell down the hill and couldn't get them. And <laughs> that's the kind of magic I love in role-playing games because it encourages people to kind of, to think strategically, and that's a blast. Mud to stone, stone to mud. <laughs> yes, those ones are always excellent. Way back when I worked on Mod with Cabal Games, which was me and Kirsten and a couple of our friends, we had a freeform magic system for a couple of reasons. Partly because we loved the feeling of building our own spells. It's very exciting. And partly because I did not want to make a bunch of spells and have to balance a bunch of spells, and I'm profoundly lazy. Like said, Bed and Breakfast has balanced spells. (laughs) Yeah, that's a... You're right. No, if they didn't bother, why should I? (laughs) <laughs> Sorry, wizards, I love you. But um <laughs> so it I've always preferred freeform magic. It's more interesting to me that way. The first draft of Heroic Chord, before I even started showing it to my friends, I wanted people to be casting spells and using combat techniques kind of based on their bonds with other people. But I wasn't able to find a version of this that that didn't get too gamey, that didn't get too, like, we're rivals because I want the bonus and the tactics that come with being rivals instead of we're rivals because I think your character's a jackass. 
and um, I wasn't able to build something that sidestepped that artificiality in a way that I was happy with. So then I kind of stripped that down a little bit, and the version that my other playtest group started with had spells as strictly cooperative. Instead of uh, reaching out into the environment like our current edition, they were actually combining spell pieces from their lists in order to cast a spell. Oh, yeah, that's right. I think that there was a little bit of that left over in the first version that I saw. Yep. Uh, Yeah, the first version I sent you still had that in there. And so the concept of scatter was that you're combining with another person and in doing so losing a bit of yourself. You're blurring into someone else. And kind of in the space between you, there's a bit of both of you that doesn't really fully return. And, I mean, I like the concept. I still love the concept. But what happened in gameplay was that instead of players being like, okay, what words do you have? Because I have, like, knife and you've got freezing and together we can make, like, a cool ice knife. And it ended up people just straight up telling someone, hey, Kirsten, I need this word from you. (laughs) (laughs) So one person would be designing, like, would design a spell and then just kind of inform the other person what it was. And that didn't feel very co-op in play. So if I can get to a spell system in Heroic Chord that retains that co-op feeling and even adjusts to accommodate character relationships, I will be thrilled and it will absolutely go in the game pretty much immediately. You guys are going to have an overnight version overhaul when I hit on that. (laughs) But for now, I decided to sidestep co-op unless you want to add one of your pieces to a spell via a cord. Because I, I mean, I can't make anything in this game be a wholly solitary process. It's a game about teamwork, after all. So before we go too much further into this, um, do the listeners know the basic gist of how this works? Oh, that's a good question. Um, So... We've cast spells in Sword of Symphonies, if you're listening to Cat's Cradle at the same rate that you're listening to Sword of Symphonies. What happens is every character has a list of what are called spell pieces. And that's a couple adjectives and a couple nouns. So the spell pieces that our real dad Marcus has are striking, protecting, advancing, armor, allies, and enemies. And... A given location will have a list of spell pieces as well. And that's a dozen adjectives and a dozen, um, ver- sorry, a dozen, dozen adjectives and a dozen nouns. And the GM will pick, as you've heard me do in the podcast, a handful, depending on the kind of place it is. And then what the character will do is combine one of their spell pieces with one of the ones in the world around them to make an effect. For example, one of the Tundra keywords is destroyed. So if our real dad Marcus wanted, he could cast a spell called destroyed enemies. Then what he would do is he would bargain with me, the GM. I'm assuming here that he's not played by me, the GM. About what exactly destroyed enemies does. An effect that solves an encounter outright is going to cost a lot more scatter than an effect that just kind of gives a stepping stone to solving the encounter. So if destroyed enemies just straight up kills everything, then that's going to cost like seven or eight scatter. That's a that's a huge spell. If, on the other hand, maybe he's up against a large swarm and it decimates a certain number of them, like one scatter per enemy it destroys then that's a little bit more manageable. And so together the GM and the player decide what's an appropriate cost and what's an appropriate effect for the spell. And then it happens. Destroyed enemies sounds like some, like, OG Dragon Quest spell naming. (laughs) A little bit. I just immediately, I went down to Tundra after looking at Marcus's page. Like, I cast Hurt More. (laughs) All right. Okay, good. Excellent. Um... Wait, wait. 
Is is deep hurting a possible spell to cast in this game? I don't think so. I know that deep is one of the words. I know that deep is a nautical coastal word. I don't know that hurting is one. There might be an injury in there somewhere. So you, you can <sighs> you you can get a, a knockoff version. <laughs> deep injury. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I hate it. So, let's take a look. The spell piece is on a beckoning infiltrator. We don't have one of these in the party, but they're lurking, hunting, watching, knife, darkness, and me. So, a uh, beckoning infiltrator could, if they were in, say, a nautical area, cast, like, um, irresistible me. Cast a spell that just kind of increases their natural charm or draws enemies toward them. Irresistible knife. Irresistible knife. I don't knife. know what that would do, but you can cast it. You can absolutely cast it. So everybody everybody wants to buy your knife. Um, powerful darkness is a nautical coastal spell that an infiltrator could cast, which, uh, I mean, it sounds both powerful and dark. It's sometimes easier to determine exactly what you want a spell to do when you're in the situation. Yeah, like, I could imagine, like you just said, like, I could imagine the same spell can do something completely different depending on the context. Yeah, because in the end, there's no set thing that the word deep does. So (laughs) depending on what exactly the player is envisioning, that's kind of what's going to be happening. Also in that case, then, um, one thing that... I also want the listeners to get a little bit more of is, as we mentioned earlier, chords. So what what Kit, we just talked about now is the the sort of like I myself am going to cast deep hurting or you know irresistible knife, um, you know, or dark lasagna or something <laughs> like that. But chords exist, which is one of the the really cool pieces of the system which we talked about earlier. But I do think chords, I think chords need a little bit more explanation because they're, they touch a few other systems in the game, which I don't know if we've actually gotten to in game yet. I mean, a couple of them we have. One of them is that, um, two of my players in Sword of Symphonies are also in my playtest group and are used to having to cast spells with another person and just kind of did that for the first couple sessions out of force of habit. If Kirsten wanted to defend herself, she'd be here. She, she is being attacked by, <laughs> uh, I don't know, space vultures or something. It's true. Yeah. Feel better, Kirsten. We love you. But um, So chords use, like a lot of the co-op actions in the game, what's called memory points. And when we do memory time, okay, when we do memory time at the end of every episode. F- fell into it a little bit there. A little bit, yeah. Force a habit, hey? Am I going to have to, like, put half of the jingle? Ha! <laughs> Just like a record scratch? <laughs> I love that, actually. Um, so memory pieces are gained from memory time. When you share something that was meaningful or interesting to you, you gain a memory piece. Unless it was your spotlight chapter. And as of right now, we haven't done any spotlight chapters yet. Um, so I'm going to go more into detail about those later on, because they're kind of a big part of the leveling mechanic in this game. But you gain your memory pieces, and they can be used for basically co-op actions. Memory points can be used to add one of your own spell pieces to someone else's spell, forming a chord. You can add a success to someone else's role, as long as that role involves a skill you've got. You can start an arpeggio, and that's something that we're going to go into another time. Arpeggios are kind of the um, kind of the physical combat manifestation of the magic mechanic, especially like the old magic mechanic. They're people working together physically in combat. Think of them like uh, the team up team up tech attacks from Chrono Trigger, or like Baton Pass in Pokemon. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah, they're they're probably a little bit more like Baton Pass. Oh, look, I didn't plan them with Baton Pass in mind. That would be something a nerd loser would do. <laughs> sure, we believe you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm trying to pretend to be cool. You guys. <laughs> You're doing an RPG podcast. No one's buying it. 
<clears throat> okay. <laughs> but but I, w- I will say that as a musician, the chord arpeggio name checks out because uh, a chord is a thing that is a big spell that happens using multiple pieces all at once, whereas an arpeggio is built up one step at a time. Oh, yeah. Usually when I say that was deliberate, I'm trying to cover for the fact that it wasn't. But no, that's exactly um, that's exactly what that was because all spells used to be chords because they always used to be cooperation. And so cooperation non-simultaneously, well, I mean a non-simultaneous chord to arpeggio. So, mm-hmm. And the last thing you can do with memory points is re- restore two hit points or scatter to an ally. So memory points are kind of like a hero point mechanic or a luck point mechanic, except you can only use them to help other people. You can't use them to help yourself. Got to be generous. You got to be generous and you've got to be kind of like party minded. You're paying attention to what your friends are doing because what they're doing is interesting and fun. And at memory time, when you reminisce about the fun, interesting things your friends have done, you gain points that you can use to make your friends cooler. And your friends gain points that they can use to make you cooler. And that's uh, it's a beautiful thing. So the other thing that this touches on, I think Nick meant, was the way the combat initiative system works. And, I mean, we're probably going to have another cat's cradle about that. But because I have always envisioned this game as being deeply cooperative, combat goes in reverse order. It goes from slowest to fastest. And anyone who hasn't acted yet can act pretty much whenever they please. So they can interrupt an opponent who's trying to attack an ally, or they can join an ally and help them on their turn. Um, Because whenever there have been co-op spells in another game I have played... It's always been like, no, you hold on to your turn, you wait on yours, and then when my turn rolls around, we'll do it, and then maybe it doesn't work, or maybe there's something else I have to do, and doing it in reverse order just means, oh, hey, you're free, let's cast a spell. Um, There's kind of a lot less uh, wrangling and waiting and thumb twiddling involved. So one of the things that was fun for me cooperatively is that we've cast a couple of spells, or a couple of chords, and every time we've done a chord... um, the person that I was doing it with uh, ended up adding a different word than I expected them to. I'm I'm really glad that that's the way you guys have been playing it because that experience I had with my other group was like I didn't want a system where you were telling your allies what to do. So the way it's been going in sort of symphonies where someone's like, actually, I think I'm going to add dazzling. I'm like, well, well dazzling. <laughs> like, I mm-hmm. guess we're dazzling. I don't know that we've got real weird with chords yet, but we're also early in the campaign. So I would like to see how weird it can get. Oh, I'm sure we'll get there later on. Yeah. No, you guys are going to get real weird with it. I trust you. (laughs) But uh, I will say the one thing, because it sounds like this was a pretty good sort of overview of sort of what you wanted there and other stuff. But the one thing that I thought was really neat that I wanted to touch on is the geomancy aspect of it, which we, we did a little bit, but... Um, the geomancy aspect was not there originally in the OG magic system that, that, uh, me, myself and Kirsten, the other group, we got to play a little bit of it before the geomancy system, uh, was, was added, or I should say the, I guess the locational words, uh, the locational spell pieces. So why did those show up? I like them, but let's, let's let every, all the listeners know where, I mean, other than the fact that you're just a big, like actual real world magic and occult nerd. Why, why, why the geomancy? I mean, you're talking to somebody who studied Latin style geomancy, and it's actually much closer to like um, math. There's a lot of binary calculations involved in it, and very little actual attention to the world around you, which <laughs> I guess is extremely Roman when you think about it. <laughs> That's, uh, ancient Roman geomancy is extremely neat, but it's it's a challenge. The reason I settled on that was. Because as far as I'm concerned, there are two major pillars in Heroic Chord. One of them is teamwork. It's important to me that the game is about people working together as a party, as partners, because the most rewarding D&D campaigns I've played have involved teamwork, have involved parties that become like close as family and who have each other's backs. 
and partly because um, when I was working on Heroic Chord, I was listening to a lot of actual play podcasts, and those always involve kind of a small party that ends up becoming quite close. And the other pillar is survival. At some point, and I can't remember exactly what train of thought led me there, but I remember that I was uh, sitting at the surveillance desk at my old terrible job (laughs) when it occurred to me. I think I could dig out the notebook even. But survival is an important part of this game, and survival is about harmony with your environment, not necessarily in like a legs crossed, lotus flower, Zen Buddhism sense, but in an awareness of your environment and an understanding of your environment and a respect for your environment sense. So since a spell system based on that first pillar hadn't given me the results I wanted, so I think it's only natural that I shifted to the second one. And rangers were already kind of expected to have an understanding of their environment and survival skills because these are survivalists. So uh, it just kind of shifted to the other leg, I guess, that the game has. I can go more into why that aspect of the game exists. I mean, yeah, I can do that. Well, then do that, nerd. You did? You, <laughs> why do I, you thought like that, this? I thought that that answered the question. Yeah. Why are you so hostile? Oh. Yeah. Because you were saying that you were just like, should Kathleen, I do a thing? It's like, we're on the podcast. Always do the thing. Kathleen, Nick's bullying me. Oh, no. You know that I, you know that I literally <laughs> cannot bully you. That was the least convincing oh, no, I've ever heard from a human being. <laughs> like that was, I, I need you to know. I, I unfelt that one. <laughs> So, like, um, no, this is a magic conversation because a long time ago, again, when we were working on Mod, some of you may or may not be aware of that game. I think it might still be up on my uh, on my drive through RPG if you're curious about just like a real, real granular modular role playing system. But we did all magic in that game through skills. And so, for me, whenever I was building a new setting or building a new hack for the game. It was always magic skills I returned to, and it was always, like, um, weird restrictions I would put on magic or weird pieces of flavor to put on magic. Once upon a time, I made an underwater setting, and I've been trying to make underwater settings for every game I've ever played since I was a preteen. My very, very first attempt at dungeon mastering uh, Bungeons and Braggins, um I did very much want to build an underwater world. Um, That's always, always, always my goal. Um, I believe Nick can testify to my readiness to put jellyfish in literally everything. You do like them. I love them. I love them. I love them floaty bastards. The one that I built for Mod, though, had different types of magic based on what uh, depth you were at. And so, like, the very, very deep magic was the stuff that, like, warps things and twists things. And the surface magic was, like, brightness and damage and danger. And um, so that was kind of my first playing around with the idea of magic that changes based on uh, geography, based on where you are physically related to these kind of arbitrary landmarks. And I started playing around with the idea of magical landmarks that affected people's magic. And I put it away. I never actually went anywhere with it until I was doing the very, very early stuff in Heroic Chord. And I realized that that was an idea not only that had really stuck with me, but that I had never actually done anything with yet. So having these magical landmarks kind of naturally lent itself to... Um, survival in remote areas. I think it was either that or something very Ravnica where the entire world is a city. And I mean, I love Ravnica, but that wasn't really where I felt like going, I guess. Uh, I'm a creature of whimsy and I felt like, I felt like going wilderness with it. And so 
That's kind of where the Daoliths as a concept came from, was this old discarded idea of magical landmarks. And instead of having magic change depending on how close you are to one, having magic bestowed on people as a reward for having reached one was uh, was where this one wound up. Is there anything else then that you want to talk about, about the magic system and where it's coming from? I think uh, my sort of the things that I thought were really cool that the listeners at home might want to know more about. We've gone over. Mm. Um, Kathleen, is there anything else that you want to, that you're dying to know? I don't know. Like I've got, I've got actually some setting questions. Okay. Well, I mean, do we want to do setting questions as part of magic or do we want to save them for next time? Are these questions about how magical the setting is? They're they're about like, yeah, they're about the magic in the setting and that sort of thing. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Far away. That's great. Lots of magic systems make a thing where it's like magic takes a toll on your body. Um, But scatter is sort of a direction where it's like, um, it's not so much taking a toll on your body as it is your spirit, but there's this kind of physicality to the idea that like you cast a spell and that leaves a part of you out in the ether. And how did you sort of come up with that direction to take it? Uh, okay. Um, that's, that's excellent. And I'm glad, I'm glad you've asked that. Um, the original plan, like I've mentioned, was to have kind of the lines between two people blurring. And I couldn't really find a way to, to express that cleanly, I guess. Um, the other thing is that I am, um, and I'm, I, this is all over the website and all over everything I say because I'm one of those sad people, but I have some brain problems. I have some major um, anxiety and depression problems. And one of the ways that I cope with things, or at least that I did before realizing that that maybe wasn't the healthiest plan, is dissociation. I have got some real disassociative uh, anxiety occurring to the point where when I would become extremely uh, stressed out or frightened, I would just not even really be in myself anymore. I'd be doing stuff, but it was like I was watching from the back seat. And um, the feeling, and Nick has alluded to this, but I am an occultist. I... If there's anything human beings have used to tell the future, I've studied it. I've, I may even have tried it. Um, I may have collected the accoutrements. I have a pretty substantial tarot deck collection. I have a degree in tarot reading from the Northern Star College of Mystical Studies. That's a real thing. That's not a joke. And so I have engaged in kind of a lot of occult practices and studied a lot more occult practices. And one thing I noticed that was that the feeling of being very deep in meditation was extremely familiar to me because the physical sensation was the same as disassociating. It wasn't accompanied by the stress and it wasn't a fear reaction. It was just kind of what happened when I let my brain I don't want to say escape myself because that makes me sound like the kind of person who only wears tie-dye. Yeah, maybe you got to lean into that these days. Oh, that is that is true, and I've already admitted to one of my three degrees. But um, the physical sensation is very similar. There's kind of a numbing of the extremities. There's a feeling of passivity and a feeling of observation. And so um, when I was thinking about what magic would feel like to do in a world where magic in a world where magic had concrete and dramatic effects what would magic feel like i kept hitting on what it has felt like in my experience which has been disassociative and so instead of scatter being a blurring between two people like the smudging of a pastel drawing or something It wound up being that, no, you're putting a part of your spirit out there and not all of it is going to come back. And I think uh, any of our listeners who've kind of done a lot of meditation, a particularly lengthy or intense one, 
you don't really wake all the way up from. <laughs> you um, you still kind of feel a little bit fuzzy for a while afterward. And so I kind of just uh, amped that one up, I guess. And that's scatter. As with everything, all roads lead to my big sad brain. <laughs> Did I guys? Did I tell you guys about the uh, the talk I'm going to be giving at an upcoming convention? A friend of mine and I are giving a talk called "The Sad Author's Guide to Role Playing Games," where we talk about the ways in which role playing games have been beneficial to our mental health and the ways in which they can be beneficial to your mental health. So uh, I'm I'm incredibly excited about it. We have been talking about doing this panel for like years. And we're finally making it happen. It's going to be great. Probably. And if you're listening to this from way far into the future, uh, hello, hi. I hope things are doing a lot better than they are now. That'd be nice. Have you fixed our world yet? Because right now it's broken. <sighs> so, yeah. So here's, here's to hoping everybody in the future <laughs> is just like, boy, I'm glad I'm not back then. <laughs> but you did miss Kat's talk, though, so, like, I, we do, talk. yeah, that is, that is unfortunate. Maybe she'll have done it again. So, I hope this has been another educational episode of Cat's Cradle, where we talked about magic. I had a blast, because I am a well-known egotist who loves talking about herself and her very many big ideas. Thank you guys so much for giving me a venue to do that. I hope you all return with us next week. I'm sure Kirsten will be back, and we'll have more adventures of Penelope and Cobb and Tissa for you, where uh, last we left off in our world, um, they totally forgot to do the job that they were supposed to. <laughs> um, we'll see if they manage to do that or if we go completely off the rails. And if you've got any questions for a future Cat's Cradle or if you've played the game and want to give us some feedback or if you're just having a real great time, you can contact us with the contact form located on peachgardengames.com or you can track us down at Peach Garden RPGs. Yeah, let us know. We hope to hear from you. Come play with us. 